The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. And this week on The Communicators, we want to talk about some of the telecommunications legislation that's being introduced in Congress. Joining us first is Representative Jared Polis. He's a Democrat from Colorado, and he has a couple pieces of legislation we want to ask him about. Representative Polis, could you start by telling us what is the EPA, the Electronic Privacy Act? Hey, Peter, how are you? Well, you know, a lot of these uh, laws were essentially written uh, before the advent of the, well, before the advent, before the popularization of uh, email, of uh, other kinds of communications are kind of written for the uh, telephonic era. So, you know, we're looking at an area where, uh, for instance, um, IRS's ability to read old emails, obviously, specifically in the Patriot Act, we have other provisions. There's sort of several things that hit at once on the, on the email privacy and personal communications privacy front. So uh, we have several bills, happy to talk about any one of them, that address different different aspects of this. But essentially, uh, digital communications, and that includes through Skype, which is increasingly replacing telephone, uh, conventional email, uh, is becoming commonplace and effectively displaced, uh, in many ways, telephone communications. Yet we have a totally different uh, set of laws around protecting people's private phone conversations than we do, for instance, for protecting their private Skype conversations, even though they're essentially the same thing to the consumer. So, Representative Polis, are, is postal mail, uh, phone calls, emails, are they treated the same by the law? when it comes to privacy. Sure, so postal mail is a different category as well. Uh, postal mail physical parcels uh, has in fact uh, the most severe criminal penalties for any type of, of tampering. Uh, on the continuum, telephonic conversations, which typically require uh, a warrant to listen into. Now, under the Patriot Act, we do have issues with foreign nationals speaking to American citizens. That's putting that aside for a minute. When two Americans are talking to one another, uh, that would be on the most protected end. Uh, a lot of the digital communications, whether that's email or Skype, uh, currently fall somewhere in the middle. What I essentially argue is it should be more similar to, uh, to telephone conversations and kind of the level of protection that we have, uh, where there has to be a reasonable due process around any law enforcement intercept. Now, did you introduce this legislation in response to uh, some of the revelations about the NSA? So the NSA issue is, it, the answer is with one piece of legislation, yes, but it's, it's a different issue. The NSA issue uh, is not around listening to conversations, it's about phone records. And it's phone records of Americans talking to foreign nationals. Um, it is permitted under the Patriot Act. Uh, now, I oppose the Patriot Act in part because I knew this sort of uh, violations of privacy were allowed. Um, I do support uh, either repealing the Patriot Act or if we want to at least find a better balance between uh, privacy and uh, protecting our country. I know that we can do it. Um, look, uh, you know, there's no doubt that on the intelligence side of things, they would rather have access to everything. Uh, if we were a totalitarian state, we, in fact, probably would be safer from terrorist attack. But the question is, you don't want to give up what makes your country special. You don't want to give up your freedom. Uh, and that's, that's how the terrorists truly win, uh, is if we give up the freedom that we have as a country. So we do need a fix on the Patriot Act. Again, I'm happy to talk about either uh, repealing it and going in a different direction. There's a number of other provisions I'm not happy with, or a narrow fix uh, around the specific uh, revelations of Snowden. So to, to go to the email question though, Representative, are our emails private at this point? Do they need to be subpoenaed? How can government officials read those? So the, uh, the biggest concern that we're addressing uh, around emails has to do with the IRS's ability to look at old emails. Uh, and again, that's without any warrant. Uh, it simply is, uh, they're, they're able to do that, whereas they're not able to, absent a court, uh, a court order, uh, access uh, phone conversations or recordings or things of that nature. Um, emails don't have that same protection. So what we're trying to do there is, again, it create some kind of due process around email communications, which would also include video email communications, for example, a Skype or a peer-to-peer -peer network communication, anything over the internet, 
uh, should have, we argue, and I believe, the, uh, a similar level of protection. It's not going to be exactly the same because the technologies are a little different, but a similar level of protection to anything you do over the telephone. Uh, and we have procedures in place that are work and are tested for when the government, whether it's law enforcement or the IRS or any other entity, does need to get at phone records. There are absolutely ways to do that. It has not impeded criminal investigations in the past at all, uh, and we just need to apply a similar set of uh, regulations to how the government can access uh, email, video communications over TCP IP. So what is the significance of 180 days? Uh, it's simply in the law. I mean, there's no, there's no great reason why it was there, but we're talking about emails that are l newer or older than 180 days and the different procedures around accessing them. I, 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 don't, it's a one, I, I don't know how they came up with why that's a cutoff point, to tell the truth. What is the opposition to protecting the emails? Um, you know, I would say in general, uh, you know, again, anybody on the law enforcement or intelligence side would argue, well, it's quicker if we have access to everything. I mean, why not listen to every phone conversation? You know, why not have a, a camera in everybody's home watching what they're doing? Why not have a tracker in everybody's car so you know exactly where it is at every time? I mean, it's a slippery slope. Of course, these things are better from a strict law enforcement perspective. If you have a tracker on every person, you know where they are at all times and they're not committing crimes. But it's at the expense of our liberty and freedom and privacy. So the challenge for policymakers is to strike the right balance where we have safety, we take uh, uh, you know uh, safety into account, the public safety, but we also uh, allow privacy and freedom. So uh, again, uh, I argue that we're too far towards kind of the police state totalitarian side of things with regard to insufficient checks and balances around government checking emails, government finding out uh, phone records, those sorts of things. And we need to balance it in a way more similar to the way we've done it traditionally, even during the height of the Cold War in the 70s and 80s, uh, uh, as well as when crime was higher in the 80s. Uh, again, uh, it's simply looking at a balance between the two, uh, a similar standard for what we already have for intercepting phone calls, for instance. So, Representative. Or a search warrant, or a search warrant of somebody's home, for instance. So, Representative Polis, with regard to your email legislation, is it bipartisan? Do you have many co sponsors? Do you foresee action in 2013? So we've talked about a couple of bills here, the, the, e the email one, we've talked about the, the phone records one with the NSA. These are all bipartisan pieces of legislation, every uh, one of them. We have strong support from both sides. I think what increasingly many Republicans have found who even might have supported some of these measures in the past, they say, well, guess what? We now have a chief executive that we don't trust or we don't like, and why did we give him all this power? And I ask any of my friends before assigning this much power to the executive branch from the legislative branch, realize that we don't have control over future chief executives. Even though I have great confidence in President Obama, I don't know who his successor will be. Uh, so we always need to make sure we have the right checks and balances, uh, legislative overwrite, and we should be very wary of assigning blanket authority to the executive side because it should come as no surprise that when authority is assigned, they will use it. Uh, Representative Polis is currently in his third term in Congress, a Democrat from Colorado, Boulder Vale, and Thornton are some of the cities in his district. What's your background? I was a tech entrepreneur before I came to Congress, uh, and I also uh, served on a school board and started a couple charter schools. As a tech entrepreneur, do you find that uh, Congress's level of understanding some of these issues, where is it? Well, you know, it's it, many of these issues, in addition to being inherently important for privacy, are also important for uh, the what we call the tech ecosystem, sort of the whole uh, growth of the internet, the confidence that people have putting their private information in the internet. If people don't know where that information is going, it'll hurt the growth of companies whose customers on the internet. People will be hesitant to share uh, information because they think the government might be getting a hold of it. So it really hurts the entire internet economy. Uh, I think members of Congress are becoming more and more net savvy. I see members with uh, iPhones and all sorts of devices that are that are doing things and uh, you know running apps and using Skype and. It's certainly not universal yet, but uh, I, I don't think Congress is too far behind the curve of the general population and hopefully they're catching up. Well, I wanted to ask you also about another piece of legislation that you have introduced, the Unlocking Technology of 2013 Act. What is that? It's another uh, bipartisan bill that uh, overturns a decision by the librarian of Congress, who actually works for us, that criminalizes cell phone unlocking, if you can believe that. So uh, this is basically uh, when, you, when you buy a cell phone, 
uh, and sometimes there's a you have some contractual obligations, and we certainly don't talk about interfering with that. But it actually criminalizes the act of delocking your own cell phone or putting in another card or changing it uh, to a different number. Uh, absolutely absurd. And, and unlocked cell phones in many countries are very popular. There's many perfectly legitimate, reasonable reasons somebody might want to do that. They might want to have two or three numbers on the same phone. Uh, they might, depending on service in different areas, want to have their phone be Verizon in one area and T-Mobile in another. Uh, and yet those are actually criminalized. And it also prevents, obviously, a lot of the innovation around cell phone applications that are being developed. So this bipartisan bill would simply uh, overrule the uh, decision of the librarian of Congress uh, and prevent people from going to jail for just unlocking their cell phones. Why is a librarian of Congress involved with cell phones? You know, like a lot of uh, members, uh, I was quite surprised to find out that we had a librarian who had these kinds of powers. <laughs> Uh, I, I knew we had a library of Congress. I, I knew somewhere in the back of my mind there was a librarian, but I didn't realize that they had this type of broad authority. Um, the argument that you'll hear is that this is to, uh, it's because of some treaty obligations that we have uh, and because of uh, a certain interpretation of laws that Congress has passed I in the past. Um, but again, uh, we argue it was, it was uh, not a necessary decision. There was a specific date. And by the way, your unlocked cell phones prior to, I, I don't remember the date, let's call it January 2013. But if you have an unlocked cell phone from prior to that date, it remains legal. It's only uh, so unlocking, unlocking cell phones after that date that this took effect that are illegal. So it just makes no sense from a policy perspective. Uh, I don't know if some attorneys made this based on some, uh, you know, with magnifying glasses looking at statutes or what. But uh, we're hoping that there's some common sense that can prevail and we can uh, repeal that. Is there a sense in Congress? Do you see feel a sense in Congress that this this is something that should pass? If we can get enough attention, Peter, I mean, again, it's one of these things that constituents, hopefully they're calling in. I mean, I, we've certainly gotten several calls. Uh, a lot of the digital freedom groups uh, uh, are engaged with this, as are different tech companies. But I mean, it's got to get on the, the agenda of members of Congress to show that this is important. And it really puts America and innovation at a competitive disadvantage uh, to the many countries that uh, certainly don't have any criminal penalty for cell phone unlocking in Europe and elsewhere. Now, uh, the uh, chairman... By the way, one more thing. Yes, I mean, if, if, if the government actually starts putting kids in jail over this, that'll also attract attention. So, I mean, again, this is something that prosecutors can do. And it might just take a, a few cases of, you know, a 19-year-old unlocked their cell phone and suddenly they find themselves in jail. And I think if public attention can be focused in that way, that would force Congress to act. Representative Polis, uh, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, has also introduced a cell phone unlocking bill, Bob Goodlatte. Mm -hmm. Could you support his bill? Yeah, I mean, there's different ways of getting there, and um, you know we have a, a bipartisan proposal uh, that I've been working on, and uh, we're happy to look at uh, other members as well. I'm glad the broader the interest, the more likely this can move forward. Uh, and uh, you know, again, I, I'm happy to work with Representative Goodlatte and others towards reach this goal because no, nobody should go to prison for simply unlocking their cell phone with no criminal intent and, and no other crime committed. It just doesn't make any sense. And as we look at some of the other telecommunications legislation on Capitol Hill, we've been joined by Congressman Jared Polis, Democrat of Colorado, cell phone unlocking and email privacy. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. And now joining us on The Communicators is Representative Justin Amash. He is a Republican from Michigan. He serves on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Representative Amash, before we start talking about specific legislation, what was your reaction to the AP phone records uh, and the NSA revelations? Well, I was uh, quite upset about them. Uh, you might say I was outraged about it. Um, it's the kind of thing that we've feared has been going on. Uh, but didn't have uh, strong evidence, didn't have anything out in the public at least. And it's the first time we're seeing that the government is dramatically overreaching, cl collecting phone records from Americans, not just journalists, but all Americans, and trying to um, use it to essentially uh, track our whereabouts uh, is the ultimate uh, direction this is going. So in reaction to that, what legislatively have you proposed? Well, we've uh, introduced the Telephone Records Protection Act. Uh, that would require a court order to go after phone records, uh, like uh, the AP phone records, for example. And I've also worked on a bill with Representative John Conyers. He's the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee. He's a Democrat. And uh, we put together a bill called the Liberty Act. And what we try to do is narrow the scope of the Patriot Act 
uh, so that it, we're only targeting people who are actually under investigation rather than sweeping up the records of all Americans. And it also uh, creates uh, more openness so that members of Congress can receive the uh, classified court cases, court opinions, that are being released by the FISA court and that only uh, members of the Intelligence Committee have access to right now. And also uh, having unclassified summaries of those cases available to the public. So in that, in that Liberty Bill that you just talked about, narrowing it to the person under investigation, uh, what is swept up now? Everything? Well, right now, the, the way the government is uh, interpreting the Patriot Act, they are treating all telephone records as relevant to the investigation of terrorism. Uh, so they are gathering and collecting everyone's telephone records. They obviously can use it to uh, track Americans. They claim that they are not using it, but that's more of a policy prohibition on their part than anything else. Uh, so what we want to do is prevent this kind of collection of records. We believe it violates the Constitution, it violates the Fourth Amendment, and we don't want this kind of uh, information being held by the government. So now, do you and John Conyers have access to the same information? He's the dean of the Michigan delegation, been here 40 years or so. Uh, do, do you have the same levels of clearance? Uh, technically, all members of Congress have top secret clearance. Uh, but because of administrative decisions, and, and this is on the part of Congress as well as the Obama administration, not all members of Congress have access to all of the court opinions. Not all members of Congress have access to all of the classified documents. Um, when we get the opportunity for a classified briefing or, or classified information being presented to us, we often just get uh, an empty room and a huge stack of papers that we have to sift through, maybe 100, 200, 300 pages of, of documents with, with no assistance. Well, uh, that's not really uh, the, the kind of um, disclosure we'd like as members of Congress. We want to represent our constituents, and uh, to do that, we need uh, a fair disclosure. So when it comes to the Liberty Bill, you and Congressman Conyers, how many co-sponsors at this point? I think we're up to about 38 co-sponsors. Uh, we continue to add them every day, and it's a very bipartisan bill. Uh, it has members of Congress um, uh, who are high-ranking Democrats. It's got... Um, Republicans who are high-ranking and, and rank-and-file members on both sides. What's the opposition? What are they saying about this bill? Well, the opposition will say that uh, the collection of these records is constitutional. Uh, they often point to a court case from the 1970s, Smith v. Maryland, which is not on point at all. It's completely distinguishable from this situation. In that case, the government was going after one person who was under suspicion and, and the operation was for a limited period of time to go after his uh, phone records using a very um, uh, primitive device we don't really use anymore. It's a pen register. Uh, right now we have computers that can calculate uh, uh, expansive data and the government is sweeping up everyone's records. So the case is not really on point. It's completely distinguishable. And uh, I'm very confident that the Supreme Court would strike down what we're doing right now. Does it take your bill any teeth out of FISA and the secret court's proceedings? No, it just makes the court more transparent. So our bill would not affect what the FISA court is doing. It would make it more transparent. When it comes to the uh, revisions to the Patriot Act, we would uh, narrow it from just relevant information. So the government can't currently just goes after relevant information. And as I said, they're sweeping up everyone's telephone records and, and other records, not just telephone records. It allows them to search all business records under the Patriot Act. Um, and we would change that to relevant and material, and the government would have to state specific and articulable facts rather than just facts to go after the information. And the information would have to pertain to the person under investigation. Uh, so that, that would narrow it so that you can only gather records on, uh, that are connected to someone who's actually under investigation. Have you gotten reaction from the leadership on this bill? I haven't heard from the leadership about it. I'm hopeful that uh, they'll provide support because it is a bipartisan effort. And uh, there are certainly senators as well who have introduced similar legislation um, in a bipartisan fashion. Now, working with uh, Democratic representatives Gerald Polis, Zoe Lofgren, you've also introduced the Telephone Records Protection Act. How is that different? What does that do specifically? Well, that uh, deals more directly with the AP phone records issue. Currently, the government only has to get an administrative subpoena to go after uh, phone records like they did in the AP phone records case. Uh, and that's an internal thing. It's all through the executive branch. 
What we would require under that bill is for the government to go to a court and get a court order showing that the material, uh, that the information is again relevant and material to an investigation. Uh, that would narrow the, the, the scope of the search and uh, would still provide the government with the information they need. If a judge said you need this information, the, the judge could provide that authority. Are current laws, particularly like the uh, Patriot Act, um, compatible with current and future technology? No, current laws aren't really compatible with uh, the, the changes in technology, and that's part of the problem we're facing right now. And, uh, and we're also facing the, the issue of how to apply the Constitution to current technologies. Uh, the original meaning of, of the Fourth Amendment would be that, uh, of course, your papers and your effects are, are free from government searches. Well, now most of our papers and effects are, are digital. They're kept on some third-party device or third-party server. So how do we apply the Constitution to that information? I believe the founders would say, well, that information is still private. As long as you had an agreement with uh, the third-party provider that they're going to keep your information private, it's treated as your private desk, your private um, place, and the government can't touch it. What is the Liberty Caucus? Uh, we have a House Liberty Caucus that meets uh, every couple weeks, and I'm the chairman of that uh, caucus. It's a group of about uh, a couple dozen members. Uh, we probably get a dozen members who show up at any particular uh, meeting, their lunch meetings. And uh, sometimes we have special guests. We're going to have uh, Judge Napolitano on uh, this week. And, and uh, it's just a group of members who are trying to get the information out, out there about bills that are coming up to make sure that we have a a pro-liberty perspective on issues, a pro-constitution perspective. And we've been talking with Justin Amash, a member of Congress from Michigan, a Republican. Thanks. Thanks. And now joining us on The Communicators is Representative Michael Capuano, who is a Democrat from Massachusetts. Representative Capuano, I want to ask you about a couple pieces of legislation that you're sponsoring, beginning with the We Are Watching You Act. What is that? Um, it is a bill that will simply require companies to put devices in your home, such as a cable box, uh, that are capable of having cameras and microphones, uh, 3D imaging and uh, thermal sensors in it to be able to determine what you are doing in your home, literally watching you in your own home. Uh, that people would be informed, number one, that they're there, they would have an option to get out of that. Uh, and if anything were being recorded, that right on the TV would uh, scroll the words, we are watching you. Uh, it's a device that has uh, that I actually thought was science fiction when I first heard about it. I thought, okay, what's the punchline? Uh, until I went and pulled some of the patent applications. And in the patent applications, uh, they are described in a manner, in my opinion, is uh, very scary and, and should be scary to anybody who cares about privacy. And Verizon is one of the companies that has a patent for this, they right? And no, well, they didn't get the patent. They, they made an application, but they're not the only ones. I mean, there's, I come to my attention now, and again, I'm not Mr. Technology, but uh, the, the, I understand that the Xbox that's coming out has some of these devices. Uh, I was just reading something about one of the Sony TVs has them built into the TV, uh, and I understand the desire for them. The, the intent is to be able to micro-target ads. Uh, right in the application on the Verizon one, again, they're no different than anybody else. They're, they're not the only ones. It says if, the, if this device if device sees that you are drinking a beer, they will target you for Budweiser ads. If they see you cuddling on your couch, they may send you an ad for marriage counseling or for, or for contraception. Those are not words I made up. Those are not experiences I, I made up. Those are directly out of the patent application by one of the most famous internationally known corporations in the world. Uh, and I would argue that uh, the average person should know that's happening and have a choice to get out of it. Does this technology exist today? That's, I don't know exactly, but I think that one of the reasons the patent was denied is because all the technology is relatively simple in today's world. It doesn't take much to put a camera and a video camera into a, in, any device, uh, and, and so therefore they could do it. Uh, it's already cable ready, uh, so you're already on cable. So I don't see that these are technologically uh, science fiction anymore. It's just a matter of whether they do it, and if they do it, to make sure that we, the consumer, are informed about it and have an option to turn it off. Congressman Capuano, what's is there a good side to this technology if we have this in our homes? Uh, I don't. I don't have to worry about that too much. My answer is, if that's what you want in your home, I 
personally wouldn't understand it, but that's your prerogative. Um, that's you know, if you want to have micro-targeted ads and you want um, your cable company and everyone else to know exactly what you're doing every minute of the day. I can't personally understand that type of lifestyle, but if that's your choice, that's fine by me. Uh, that's why I'm not, uh, we didn't try to prevent the technology. Uh, we simply wanted people to know what's happening to them. And specifically, what does the We Are Watching You Act do? Uh, it specifically requires that the consumer be clearly notified of it, have an option to get out of it, uh, and if they choose to get out of the system, that they have the same option. So, for instance, if a cable company said, yeah, you can get out of it, but if you get out of it, you can only have channels 1 through 10, that's not acceptable. Uh, so be able to get out of it and have the same uh, access to cable or whatever other service it might be. Uh, and uh, when they're recording, you know, again, these devices would probably be on 24 hours a day, even when your TV wasn't on. Uh, we don't unplug our TVs. They just stay plugged in all the time, even when you think they're off. Uh, that uh, it, whenever it's on, you would have a, some, a, a scroll across the bottom of the screen that we say we are watching you. I mean, obviously, that's, that's not as a little catchy phrase, but it's also true that if it's happening, uh, I certainly would want to know about it. Before we ask you about your other piece of legislation, uh, do you have a certain philosophy about all this watching and privacy issues? Yeah, I'm a very private guy in, in the sense that, look, I, I, my telephones, I turn the GPS off. And I'm not trying, I'm not doing anything wrong. I just, it's a matter of privacy, that's all. Yet, I, for instance, I have one of those transponders that allows me to travel down the Massachusetts Turnpike and through uh, toll boots. Uh, that's my choice. I could choose to take it off. It is my choice. It's sitting right on my windshield, so I know what's going on. Uh, for me, Privacy is about the person being able to control your own life within as much reasonable expectation as you have. We've all come to understand that there are cameras on the public street. We all know that. But when it comes time to have cameras in your own bedroom or in your own living room, uh, I certainly think that that should be your choice. The Black Box Privacy Protection Act, what is that, Congressman? Almost every car made in America today, or actually made any place in the world, and soon to be every car that is made in America, sold in America today, is required to have a black box device. Most cars have them now. The current use of the black box device is to, it's what actually triggers your air, air um, the airbag system. So it's the thing that senses whether, when you have a crash. The problem is that under current rules, there's no limitations on the use of the information that goes into this device. This is the device, that if you have an accident, it, the, the, the police Police, your insurance company, a court, anyone, anyone can pull this device out who knows what they're doing. Obviously not me, but somebody, a 15-year-old technologically competent child could do it. They could pull this device out and know exactly how fast you were going, whether your seatbelt was on, uh, whether you applied the brakes, and if so, what pressure, which in and of itself doesn't bother me because it's a safety feature. But first of all, number one, most people don't know those devices are in their cars. Number two, you don't have a choice of turning them off. Uh, and number three, there is no limitation on who owns that information. And number four, there's nothing in law that Pro, that limits the amount of information that could, could be developed here. Uh, right now, it's only a few seconds before any potential accident, but there's nothing that says it, it, they couldn't just decide to maintain every inch of, every ounce of information every minute uh, you're driving. Uh, and again, all this does is uh, notifies consumers, allows them an option out, and clearly identifies who owns the information. In this case, it would be the car. When you buy a car, it's yours. It's not, unless you get a loan, obviously, and you share it with the bank, but it's, it's your car. Anything in that car is yours, depending on what radio station you, you turn. And I would argue that any information on that automobile should be yours. Obviously, any information that's possible, first of all, you should know about. Second of all, could and should be subject to a warrant if that becomes necessary at a later time. Uh, but that's what this is about. Again, it's more consumer information uh, and the ability to control your own information in, uh, in, in your own vehicle. With both pieces of legislation that we've been discussing with you, did you consider trying to outlaw the technology or outlaw the use of the black box information? I, I, I did not, uh, and, and I didn't because I'm not against technology. Technology is a great thing, and again, I'm, I, for me, I'm not trying to tell you or anyone else how to live. If that's your choice, go right ahead. Uh, I simply want the option, I think everyone should have the option to make their own decision. Uh, it shouldn't be government, it shouldn't be a private company, no matter how big they are, uh, and no one else should know what's good for you other than you. Uh, and so that's really been my focus. It's not trying to prohibit technology. I think that's impossible to do. And it's probably not smart in the long run because a lot of these technologies have other applications. Uh, and there are some people that don't mind this technology in their lives, and that's fine by me. Now, with regard to cars, uh, insurance companies are getting in on this act of monitoring, aren't they? Yes, they are. 
Uh, and, and I understand that. I mean, on some levels, they would have some sort of an obligation from their perspective to determine who's a good driver, who's a bad driver, who's a safe driver. Um, they have to set rates. And I understand their business needs for, for wanting that information. Uh, and if the information's available, I really couldn't even blame them for doing it. So therefore, for me, it should be in my control as to what information they can get from me. Um, Representative Capuano, have you, what kind of response have you gotten from your uh, uh, colleagues on um, Capitol Hill? It, the, 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 the we are watching you has garnered some support lately only because most people look at it and they, they look at it the exact same way I did. Is that The first thing you read is you have to figure it's a joke and where's the punchline? And then you think, well, it's science fiction. It's a million years away. And then that's why on the, on the releases I put out and the dear colleagues I put out to my, to my, my colleagues here in the Congress, I've actually attached copies of the patent itself, it, not for any reason other than to show them this is real. I didn't make this up. I didn't, I didn't make up these quotes or these examples. This is directly out of a, an official patent filed by a major international corporation. Um, so we've gotten some re fair response on this. The problem is a lot of this information, even to members of Congress, they just don't know it. I, I think you could walk down the street today and tap to the shoulders of 100 people on any street in America, and I, my guess is 95 to 99 percent of them don't know that their car probably has one of these black boxes in it right now, uh, or what that information is, or, or how it could be used against them. Uh, so therefore, until people know it, uh, they really can't have an honest discussion about it and exactly what the, this society wants. What about when it comes to cell phones or tablets and the tracking? Have you looked at those issues as uh, well? Only tangentially. I mean, there are a lot of these things that people already know. I mean, cell phones is, is a classic example. Most people know that when you turn that GPS device on, or, or even even if you don't, that you could probably can be tracked on a cell phone. But I do think that, uh, that the, the whole panoply of invasions of privacy really are subject long overdue for an honest discussion. Uh, and my hope is that these bills will trigger that, to have these discussions, uh, not just limited to this technology, because honestly, once I've filed this, these bills, I've actually become more aware of other devices that are out there that I didn't know about. So that I think as, as America looks at these bills, my hope is that they wonder, what is it that we as Americans want to do about sharing our information with the government or, with our, or sharing our information with companies? Uh, and I think that that discussion will be a, a good one. It's, I, in my opinion, it's overdue. Uh, but then we might even come to a conclusion that I disagree with. But at least it will be a thoughtful one and one that people have had uh, participated in. Right now, uh, uh, the silence is deafening. Do you have bipartisan sponsors, and what about a Senate sponsor? Uh, we have some bipartisan sponsors in the House, and again, uh, every day, I just had two people on the floor of the House today, just uh, before I came here, we were having a vote, and uh, they said, I heard about this bill, could you get me on this bill? So uh, again, it's, it's information is growing. We do have some bipartisan support. I don't know that we have bicameral support yet, uh, but I think it's more of a lack of information than it is anything else. Did you introduce these prior to the revelations about the NSA? Um, I've been working on the, on the We Are Watching You bill for about three or four months because I just found out about this uh, last late last year, so about five months we've been working on it. Uh, the black box bill we've introduced, I think, for the last four years, or three or four years, something like that. We've been talking with Representative Michael Capuano, a Democrat of Massachusetts. He sits on the Financial Services, Transportation and Infrastructure and Ethics Committees in the Congress. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you very much.